August through the peephole. His eyes are about an inch below where they should be on his face, almost to halfway down his cheeks. They slant downward at an extreme angle, almost like diagonal slits that someone cut into his face, and the left one is noticeably lower than the right one. They bulge outward because his eye cavities are too shallow to accommodate them. The top eyelids are always halfway closed, like he's on the verge of sleeping. The lower eyelids sag so much they almost look like a piece of invisible string is pulling them downward. You can see the red part on the inside, like they're almost inside out. He doesn't have eyebrows or eyelashes. His nose is disproportionately big for his face and kind of fleshy. His head is pinched in on the sides where the ears should be, like someone used giant pliers and crushed the middle part of his face. He doesn't have cheekbones. There are deep creases running down both sides of his nose to his mouth, which gives him a waxy appearance. Sometimes people assume he's been burned in a fire. His features look like they've been melted, like the drippings on the side of a candle. Several surgeries to correct his palate have left a few scars around his mouth, the most noticeable one being a jagged gash running from the middle of his upper lip to his nose. His upper teeth are small and splay out. He has a severe overbite and an extremely undersized jawbone. He has a very small chin. When he was very little, before a piece of his hip bone was surgically implanted into his lower jaw, he really had no chin at all. His tongue would just hang out of his mouth with nothing underneath to block it. Thankfully, it's better now. He can eat, at least. When he was younger, he had a feeding tube. And he can talk. And he's learned to keep his tongue inside his mouth, though that took him several years to master. He's also learned to control the drool that used to run down his neck. These are considered miracles. When he was a baby, the doctors didn't think he'd live. He can hear, too. Most kids born with these types of birth defects have problems with their middle ears that prevent them from hearing, but so far, August can hear well enough through his tiny, cauliflower-shaped ears. The doctors think that eventually he'll need to wear hearing aids, though. August hates the thought of this. He thinks the hearing aids will get noticed too much. I don't tell him that the hearing aids would be the least of his problems, of course, because I'm sure he knows this. Then again, I'm not really sure what August knows or doesn't know, what he understands and doesn't understand. Does August see how other people see him? Or has he gotten so good at pretending not to see that it doesn't bother him? Or does it bother him? When he looks in the mirror, does he see the Augie mom and dad see? Or does he see the Augie everyone else sees? Or is there another August he sees, someone in his dreams behind the misshapen head and face? Sometimes when I looked at Grands, I could see the pretty girl she used to be underneath the wrinkles. I could see the girl from Ipanema inside the old lady walk. Does August see himself as he might have looked without that single gene that caused the catastrophe of his face? I wish I could ask him this stuff. I wish he would tell me how he feels. He used to be easier to read before the surgeries. You knew that when his eyes squinted, he was happy. When his mouth went straight, he was being mischievous. When his cheeks trembled, he was about to cry. He looks better now, no doubt about that. But the signs we use to gauge his moods are all gone. There are new ones, of course. Mom and Dad can read every single one. But I'm having trouble keeping up. And there's a part of me that doesn't want to keep trying. Why can't he just say what he's feeling like everyone else? He doesn't have a trach tube in his mouth anymore that keeps him from talking. His jaw's not wired shut. He's 10 years old. He can use his words. But we circle around him like he's still the baby he used to be. We change plans, go to plan B, interrupt conversations, go back on promises depending on his moods, his whims, his needs. That was fine when he was little. But he needs to grow up now. We need to let him, help him, make him grow up. Here's what I think. 
We've all spent so much time trying to make August think he's normal that he actually thinks he is normal. And the problem is, he's not. High School What I always loved most about middle school was that it was separate and different from home. I could go there and be Olivia Pullman, not Via, which is my name at home. Via was what they called me in elementary school, too. Back then, everyone knew all about us, of course. Mom used to pick me up after school, and August was always in the stroller. There weren't a lot of people who were equipped to babysit for Augie, so Mom and Dad brought him to all my class plays and concerts and recitals, all the school functions, the bake sales, and the book fairs. My friends knew him. My friend's parents knew him. My teachers knew him. The janitor knew him. Hey, how you doing, Augie? He'd always say, and give August a high five. August was something of a fixture at PS22. But in middle school, a lot of people didn't know about August. My old friends did, of course, but my new friends didn't. Or if they knew, it wasn't necessarily the first thing they knew about me. Maybe it was the second or third thing they'd hear about me. Olivia? Yeah, she's nice. Did you hear she has a brother who's deformed? I always hated that word, but I knew it was how people described Augie. And I knew those kinds of conversations probably happened all the time out of earshot. Every time I left the room at a party or bumped into groups of friends at the pizza place. And that's okay. I'm always going to be the sister of a kid with a birth defect. That's not the issue. I just don't always want to be defined that way. The best thing about high school is that hardly anybody knows me at all. Except Miranda and Ella, of course. And they know not to go around talking about it. Miranda, Ella, and I have known each other since the first grade. What's so nice is we never have to explain things to one another. When I decided I wanted them to call me Olivia instead of Via, they got it without my having to explain. They've known August since he was a little baby. When we were little, our favorite thing to do was play dress-up with Augie, load him up with feather boas and big hats and Hannah Montana wigs. He used to love it, of course, and we thought he was adorably cute in his own way. Ella said he reminded her of E.T. She didn't say this to be mean, of course, though maybe it was a little bit mean. The truth is, there's a scene in the movie when Drew Barrymore dresses E.T. in a blonde wig, and that was a ringer for Augie in our Miley Cyrus heyday. Throughout middle school, Miranda, Ella, and I were pretty much our own little group. Somewhere between super popular and well-liked. Not brainy, not jocks, not rich, not druggies, not mean, not goody-goody, not huge, not flat. I don't know if the three of us found each other because we were so alike in so many ways, or that because we found each other, we've become so alike in so many ways. We were so happy when we all got into Faulkner High School. It was such a long shot that all three of us would be accepted, especially when almost no one else from our middle school was. I remember how we screamed into our phones the day we got our acceptance letters. This is why I haven't understood what's been going on with us lately now that we're actually in high school. It's nothing like how I thought it would be. Major Tom Out of the three of us, Miranda had almost always been the sweetest to August, hugging him and playing with him long after Ella and I had moved on to playing something else. Even as we got older, Miranda always made sure to try to include August in our conversations, ask him how he was doing, talk to him about Avatar or Star Wars or Bone or something she knew he liked. It was Miranda who had given Augie the astronaut helmet he wore practically every day of the year when he was five or six. She would call him Major Tom, and they would sing Space Oddity by David Bowie together. It was their little thing. They knew all the words and would blast it on the iPod and sing the song out loud. Since Miranda's always been really good about calling us as soon as she got home from summer camp, I was a little surprised when I didn't hear from her. I even texted her and she didn't reply. I figured maybe she had ended up staying in the camp longer now that she was a counselor, 
Maybe she'd met a cute guy. Then I realized from her Facebook wall that she'd actually been back home for a full two weeks. So I sent her an IM and we chatted online a bit, but she didn't give me a reason for not calling, which I thought was bizarre. Miranda had always been a little flaky, so I figured that's all it was. We made plans to meet downtown, but then I had to cancel because we were driving out to visit Tata and Papa for the weekend. So I ended up not seeing either Miranda or Ella until the first day of school. And I have to admit, I was shocked. Miranda looked so different. Her hair was cut in this super cute bob that she dyed bright pink of all things. And she was wearing a striped tube top that A, seemed way inappropriate for school, and B, was totally not her usual style. Miranda had always been such a prude about clothes. And here she was, all pink-haired and tube-topped. But it wasn't just the way she looked that was different. She was acting differently, too. I can't say she wasn't nice, because she was, but she seemed kind of distant, like I was a casual friend. It was the weirdest thing in the world. At lunch, the three of us sat together like we always used to, but the dynamics had shifted. It was obvious to me that Ella and Miranda had gotten together a few times during the summer without me, though they never actually said that. I pretended not to be at all upset while we talked, though I could feel my face getting hot, my smile being fake. Although Ella wasn't as over-the-top as Miranda, I noticed a change in her usual style, too. It's like they had talked to each other beforehand about redoing their image at the new school, but hadn't bothered to clue me in. I admit, I had always thought I was above this kind of typical teenage pettiness, but I felt a lump in my throat throughout lunch. My voice quivered as I said, see you later, when the bell rang.